So we all know that we need structure in order to pull anything off in our classrooms. So Carrie Lee, would you like to speak to some of the rules of engagement um, around Socratic to ensure that it's run with fidelity in classrooms? So the basic setup of a Socratic seminar in any format is going to be having the students having some kind of discourse over specific content or text. So the very first thing to do is to choose that text or content that they're going to be using. The second thing that they need to do is then generate those questions. So as we stated earlier, you want to really work with them on what inquiry looks like and how to develop, develop those questions. Then the students meet together. and. Part of the rules of engagement to begin with is that they need to understand scholarly language as well. So there is a little setup to be for you, to do before you can actually hold a Socratic seminar in your classroom. That scholarly language needs to be, I hear you say, I understand your point, I agree, I disagree, those kind of um, sentence starters to allow your students to kind of back away from that opinion base to more, um, let's actually talk about the content and what I see in the evidence. After that, you're going to have your students all sit together and face one another. So that's another kind of uh, thing you have to think about is where you're going to hold this Socratic seminar. And then you have the students begin the conversation. It can start with the teacher posing a question to the group, or it can start with a student posing a question to the group. It is then a question that then it has a response and a response and a response until another question is posed. Then it transitions to that question, and then the conversation just continues. There's a point where you'll kind of feel that lull happen, where everybody's kind of had that conversation for a while, and that's when then the teacher will either wrap it up or pose another question or transition the students in and out depending on how your setup is. So the basic um, foundations of a Socratic seminar is just to remember that academic language, the scholarly language, and that it's based on content or text. Would anyone like to speak to some protocols that, that they find are essential to run Socratic with fidelity in your classrooms? Sure, I'll start. Um, so for me, I make sure that building up to our very first fish, our fishbowl discussion Socratic seminar of the year, there's a lot of front loading. We talk a lot about what the COSTIS questions are, a lot about what um, inquiry is and how to provide evidence for you know, questions and our answers and that sort of thing. And so it can be days of lessons leading up to our actual discussion. And that ensures that students are prepared for the discussion itself so the discussion isn't a flop and they have, you know, they sit there in silence. Um, and so the day of the discussion, I've pre-assigned the groups um, so the kids know if they're going to be in the first group having that first discussion or if they're going to be the first group of the evaluators. And so they come to the class with their roles in mind, um, their questions prepared, the materials ready to go, and when they come into my classroom, my room is small, and you'll see that on the video, so I'm unable to make a circle, which is how I've done it in the past. So you'll see a long rectangular table where the kids are all sitting at that, but they're still facing each other. Um, and so they come, in the, they come to their seats, and they know who, um, the outside people understand who they're evaluating. They have one person that they're looking at primarily, and then, um, you know, make overall comments on the rest Especially of the group, but then they come to their seats, they the start the discussion based on me article. reminding reminding them of what the question is we've been researching or thinking on, um, and then it just starts at that point. And like Carolee said, if there's a lull, it depends on when the lull occurs. If it's early into the conversation and I know that they have more to say, but they're just feeling maybe uncomfortable or not as confident, I'll wait. And it's difficult because as a teacher, you want to make sure that you're filling all of that time with mm -hmm. something to be said. But it's very valuable for them to know that like, this is theirs. They have to take ownership, ownership of it. And so you know, they might sit for a minute or two, and then eventually somebody will say, oh, fine, I have something else to say. And then they'll, <laughs> they'll start the conversation again. And I've found that typically after those lulls, the conversation ends up being even more um, fruitful and rewarding. I've noticed a common theme, and, and we've all alluded to it, is students have complete control at this point. Mm -hmm. I imagine that there are barriers that you've all had to overcome as you've mastered the art of running Socratic in your, in your classrooms. Would you like to speak to some of those challenges, some of your experiences, and some solutions that you've um, found around them and, and clearly what you've also helped coach teachers through? I would say the very first thing that I always tell a teacher who's going to ever attempt 
a Socratic seminar is it's the good, the bad, the ugly. The first time you do it, it's going to be ugly. And you just have to know that and it has to be okay. And you have to let the kids know that that's probably going to happen. Um, because there's so many pieces to it and the kids, it's the first time they're getting to actually lead the conversation. And so they're like, oh, can I actually say this? Can I jump in? And then all of a sudden the kids will get better at it. So then that's where it becomes not so bad. So then it's the not so bad and then finally it's great and it becomes the thing your kids want to do and they will work towards that. So I think knowing that going in that it doesn't have to be perfect, that it's not going to look like these three exemplars here that, you know, they've been doing this for a long time. It's not going to look like that. It's going to be a little rough and that's okay. And I think it's important for teachers to, for me, my, myself, is to consider that growth mindset piece for myself. In my classroom, we're not there yet. I wouldn't say I'm an exempt, my classroom's an exemplar by any means, but we're not there yet. There are things that we definitely want to grow in. There are pieces that these ladies do that I really want to make sure that I'm implementing on a regular basis, like the rubrics and the way that they have their students um, monitor one another. And so there are areas that I know from the very beginning um, I, I took it in small chunks. I wanted to master this element. I wanted to master the fact that they knew they were gonna come together and ask high level questions. And if we got there, that's awesome. And the next time I wanted to master the fact that I didn't interject because as teachers, a lot of times we feel like we have to carry the weight. And so you feel nervous when you, the conversation isn't where it should be just yet. And it's really important to let the students naturally carry the conversation because it's in them. They'll get there. Um, so it's looking for opportunity to um, redirect when necessary and then hold my tongue when not. Um, and so I've grown in that space as well. Um, it's trusting my students. Mm. It's trusting myself that I've set them up for success mm. and then trusting them um, of all grade levels. I've worked with the Socratic Seminar and just trusting them in that conversation. And they really do a great job. I think really just listening and note taking and seeing if they're giving evidence of why they chose their answer. So no, mm. it's not so much what the answer is, but how they came to that. And across the district, we're using the Marz Marzano framework. So this is a really nice way to get them into that DQ4, that deeper level thinking. So it's a nice way for me to see if they're using some of that terminology, mm -hmm. some of that language, and some of that deeper thinking, not just saying, okay, this is my answer and I'm mm -hmm. done, and really listening to each other and really Chasing diving in. So it's a lot of my note taking and some, depending on who the student is, just prepping them a little bit beforehand. And throughout the workshop, because I do this as an activity at the end of the workshop, so throughout the workshop, preparing them for that, um, a lot of front loading, like you were saying. Um, it's one of the things that the students have learned is that I'm not the source of the information. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I started, one thing I wanted to mention is when I started, a lot of times they would say something and then look at me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to stare at the ceiling. <laughs> I have to remind them that I'm not in this conversation. And they've gotten finally to the place where they stop looking over at me. Because especially when they're trying to examine their reasoning um, and errors in reasoning, they want to say, am I right? Or did she get it wrong? And so I, I have to be the one that is encouraging that they're the ones that carry that knowledge. What Vanessa was stating is that the teacher starts at as um, the other teachers are stating, you, you start in that really front loading and mm -hmm. you're the one delivering the content, you're giving it to them. But then you want all the ownership to change to the student, mm -hmm. so you become a true facilitator. That is that moment that you know that the kids are really owning it when they no longer need to look at you for approval or am I doing this right or is that the kind of question you wanted me to say or did I look at the right quote? Or, so that's the real moment that you know a Socratic is being really successful mm -hmm. is that the students no longer know you're there. Mm -hmm. And you can just do that true monitoring piece. And so I think that's how it changes is we move from that traditional teaching method of up in the front of the room and owning all of the content knowledge ourselves and being the only people doing the work to the students are the ones doing in the work and the students are teaching one another. And we're just there monitoring and facilitating. I can't thank you all enough for, for coming on today's show and allowing us to film you. Um, I think just sharing your journeys with our teachers as they embark upon this, this monumentous task of tackling a Socratic seminar, I think it's a very intimidating structure because it involves complete student-led classrooms. There's got to be a lot of student structure in place in order to facilitate a Socratic seminar with fidelity. Um, the role of the teacher in the Socratic needs to be very, very clearly defined. Um, there are many intricacies that need to be addressed and so I really feel that just you sharing upon your journey and how you were able to tackle those challenges and solution storm around them is going to help a lot of our teachers in our district take on Socratic Seminar.
Thanks for joining us. I hope you benefited from tuning in. To cover more hot topics requested by our teachers, we'll be hosting the Why of Teaching series. If you want more information about these videos that you've seen in the show, you can go to newsroom.pcsb.org. If you'd like to suggest a topic or share a strategy, you can email the Strategic Communications Department at news at pcsb.org. It's been a pleasure being your host this evening. Have a great night. And as Nelson Mandela says, education is the most powerful weapon in which you can use to change the world.